thanks for joining me. For first timers, my name is Mindy Mandel, and this channel is called All About Platonism. Each week I talk about one of Plato's dialogues. This week we're going to look at one called Greater Hippias, or some translators call it Hippias Major. It's a fun dialogue, not one of the more popular ones, but there's actually a lot of good things going on here. We're going to see Socrates being a little bit witty and fun, and I enjoyed putting this one together. I hope you enjoy it too. In this dialogue, we get to see Socrates being witty and playful. Plato managed to make this dialogue fun and easy to read, but actually the topic itself is really quite challenging. So Socrates' conversation is with the sophist Hippias, and Hippias is in town from Elis. Now from his discussion with Socrates, it's clear that he is a well-paid sophist, and he is involved in political affairs. He says that Ellis looks on me as her best judge and reporter of anything said by other governments, and so I am always the first choice among her citizens to be her ambassador when she has business to settle with another state. And by the way, all of our translations today are thanks to Benjamin Joet. Well, they talk about how much money modern sophists are able to make. And Socrates kind of toys with Hippias here, commenting on how simple philosophers of the past were. He says, none of those great men of the past ever saw fit to charge money for his wisdom. Well, Hippias is actually proud of his wealth. He says, I feel pretty sure that I have made more money than any two other sophists you like to mention put together. Now, actually, it seems like all the sophists brag about being the best paid or the highest paid, so I'm not sure which one actually was. But anyway, Hippias, it seems, was a very wealthy man. And when he tells this to Socrates, Socrates shoots back a sarcastic remark. He says, what honorable, what powerful testimony to your own wisdom and that of your contemporaries and to their great superiority to the men of the past. Well, their conversation eventually turns to the question of what beauty is. Socrates says this, Quite lately, my noble friend, when I was condemning as ugly some certain compositions and praising others as beautiful, somebody threw me into confusion by interrogating me in a most offensive manner, rather to this effect. You, Socrates, pray, how do you know what things are beautiful and what are ugly? Come now, can you tell me what beauty is? Now, this man who interrogates Socrates is going to be mentioned a few times throughout the dialogue, and we're going to see that person again at the very end. But for now, let's stick to this question about beauty. I want you to consider this exchange between Socrates and Hippias. Then are not all beautiful things beautiful by beauty? Yes, by beauty, which has a real existence. Yes, what else do you think? Then tell me, what is this thing, beauty? Now I should point out here that in this dialogue, we're not yet getting any discussion about what it means to have a real existence, as you see in this quote. That is significant. But this is still an early dialogue, and so the notion of things in themselves is not yet developed. We're not yet getting the theory of forms or a more mature presentation of these real existences. We will get that when we get to the middle and late dialogues. So what we have here, as we saw with Lysis, is a lot of terminology and concepts being introduced. Plato is getting us to start thinking of this idea, and the idea of things in themselves is quite far removed from our conventional view. Right? Our conventional view is that what is physical is most real. But for Plato, it was the opposite. What is most real is beyond the physical world, and our world of materiality participates in real existences. And the idea of participation also will come in with later dialogues. All right, so with all of this in mind, let's get back to the dialogue. We're going to see that Hippias holds that conventional view that what is physical is what is real. So he does not see a difference between beauty itself and things that are beautiful. He asks, what is the difference between them? 
You think there is none? Hmm, there is no difference. Well, from here, Hippias is going to start giving us his definitions of beauty. Now, if we had any doubts before that Plato had little respect for Hippias, it's going to become obvious now. Because this first definition, it's genuinely stupid. He says, a beautiful maiden is a beauty. Well, Socrates can easily tear this one down. He says that if maidens are grouped with gods, will not the most beautiful maiden appear ugly? So now Hippias has to come up with a second definition. And he manages to come up with one that is even dumber than the first. He says, I suppose we all know that if anything has gold added to it, it will appear beautiful when so adorned, even though it appeared ugly before. Oh, sorry. So gold is the real definition of beauty, according to him. While well, Socrates, again, is able to swipe this one down effortlessly, he needed only to refer to a beautiful statue of Athena that was made of ivory. And he says the point is that the artist did not give his Athena eyes of gold or use gold for the rest of her face or for her hands or for her feet, as he would have done if supreme beauty could be given to them only by the use of gold. No, he made them ivory. Well, Socrates does eventually bring Hippias to say that whatever is appropriate to a particular thing makes that thing beautiful. Socrates is going to come back to this definition later, but first, Hippias is going to offer yet another one of his brilliant definitions of beauty. He says, Then I maintain that always, everywhere, and for every man, it is most beautiful to be rich, healthy, honored by the Greeks, to reach old age, and after bearing his parents nobly, himself to be born to the tomb with solemn ceremony by his own children. Well, obviously, this is not what Socrates was looking for. What Hippias is giving here is a certain image of the good life. And undoubtedly, it is an image that is shared by many, but it is still an image all the same. So Socrates, again, wants to define beauty itself. And this is a useful definition, so let's look at it with him. That which gives the property of being beautiful to everything to which it is added, to stone and wood, and man and God, and every action and every branch of learning. Last week when we looked at the Lysis, I talked a little bit about the dialogue symposium. I'm going to mention it again here because, again, we're getting a little bit of foreshadowing of what is going to be in the symposium. In that dialogue, Socrates is going to give us a hierarchy of beautiful things. It's kind of like a ladder that leads up to beauty itself. Now, this definition that we're looking at right here is a taste of that. Notice here that he's referring not just to beautiful people and objects, but he also mentions actions branches of learning, and of course, the gods. Socrates is going to further clarify the beautiful itself a few lines later. He says, that which is beautiful always and for everyone. Well, at this point, Socrates decides to help Hippias out. He returns them to the definition that the beautiful is the appropriate. He says, now consider this appropriateness and reflect on the general nature of the appropriate and see whether it might not be beauty. They're eventually going to move from the appropriate to the useful to the powerful. Now we do see the idea of function as beauty in many areas of modern art and design. There are whole university courses on this. We see it in architecture and furniture design and now we see it in graphic arts and even the designing of web pages. Plato was a big influence in these areas, but what we want to focus on here is to go beyond the practical application of these theories. We want to look at these ideas through a philosophical lens. Socrates says, That which has the power to achieve its specific purpose is useful for the purpose which it has the power to achieve. And that which is without that power is useless. Hippias agrees, certainly. Now they are going to tighten this definition up a bit 
because they recognize that some things are useful for achieving evil, but that's not their definition of beauty. So Socrates clarifies that what we really had in mind to say was that beauty is that which is both useful and powerful for some good purpose. Socrates then calls this the beneficial. He says this is equivalent to beneficial, is it not? And then Socrates gets Hippias to agree that beauty is the beneficial. So we reach the conclusion that beautiful bodies and beautiful rules of life and wisdom and all the things we mentioned just now are beautiful because they are beneficial, evidently. Then it looks as if beauty is the beneficial, Hippias, undoubtedly. But now they have a problem. The beneficial can be defined this way. Now, the beneficial is that which produces good. Yes. And that which produces is identical with the cause? That is so. Then the beautiful is the cause of the good. Notice that Socrates plugged in the word beautiful for beneficial. And he could do this because he had equated them before. Well, they have a problem because cause and effect are never the same. A cause is always prior to its effect, and it's always something different. Like simple example is if you eat spicy food, you might get heartburn. Now the spicy food is the cause, and the heartburn is the effect. So if spicy food causes heartburn, then spicy food is not itself heartburn. The two, spicy food and heartburn, are two different things. In the same way, if the beautiful is the cause of the good, then the beautiful is not itself good. If then beauty is the cause of the good, then the good would be brought into existence by beauty, and it would appear that we devote ourselves to the pursuit of wisdom and all other beautiful things for the reason that their product and offspring, the good, is worthy of devotion. And from our explorations, it looks as though beauty is metaphorically a kind of father of the good. Hippias says, certainly you say well, Socrates. Do I not say this also well? That the father is not his son, nor the son his father. Quite well. Then most certainly, my good sir, beauty is not good, nor the good beautiful. Do you think that possible after our discussion? No, I most certainly do not. Well, they're going to drop this line of inquiry. But Plato is leaving us to consider that true relationship between the good and the beautiful. And that is the topic that is covered in the Dialogue Symposium. For the last section of their, dis excuse me, for the last section of their discussion, Socrates is going to limit the beautiful to only what can be seen and heard. Just to make it easier, I think, to work with. And he defines the beautiful as the pleasurable. He says, come now, if we were to say that whatever we enjoy, I do not mean to include all pleasures, but only what we enjoy through our senses of hearing and sight. If we were to say that this is beautiful, how should we fare in our struggle? Well, this definition would include a number of beneficial things. People, music, discourses, stories, also artwork. However, it would exclude a few things as well. Laws and practices, for example, and also any pleasures that were gained through the other physical senses. But they decide to stay with just sight and hearing for now. And then Socrates uses this to point out that sight itself is not what makes anything beautiful. If it were, the sounds then if sight is what made things beautiful, then sounds would not also be beautiful, and vice versa. Then they have something identical which makes them to be beautiful, a common quality which appertains to both of them in common, and to each singly. So what Socrates is pointing out here is that beauty must be inherent in the thing that is beautiful. It is not added by our physical senses or even in the case of laws and practices, it's not added by the thoughts that we bring to them. Well, they don't develop this, this line of 
thinking here, the conversation really ends without any solution being found. So Plato is leaving it to us to think about what is this inherent quality that makes things beautiful. Now, by the end of the dialogue, we find that Hippias is getting annoyed with Socrates. He reiterates his belief that the good life is one of wealth and social status and all the benefits that they bring. And then he says, These then are the things to which a man should hold fast, abandoning these petty fogging arguments of yours, Socrates, unless he wishes to be accounted a complete fool, because he occupies himself, as we are now doing, with trumpery nonsense. While Socrates whimsically acknowledges this conventional point of view, he says, I wander about in unending perplexity, and when I lay my perplexity before you, wise man, you turn on me and you batter me with abuse as soon as I have explained my plights. Socrates then is going to make reference to that offensive man who interrogates him. This is the one he mentioned at the beginning of the conversation. He says, when in turn I am convinced by you and repeat exactly what you tell me, that the height of excellence is the ability to produce an eloquent and beautiful speech and win the day in a law court or any other assembly, I am called every kind of bad name by some of the audience, including especially that man who is always cross-questioning me. He is a very close relative of mine and lives in the same house. What Plato is doing here is he's using Socrates to model for us the state of mind of a philosopher. We must resist ideas simply because they're popular. And we need to have the courage to listen to our own intuitive sense of what is right. What Plato is saying here, what Socrates is saying here is, don't be afraid to keep questioning yourself. Don't be afraid to keep arguing with yourself, as Socrates does. There is great value in those arguments. Well, Socrates ends by saying that he now understands a proverb that is popular in his day. All that is beautiful is difficult. Well, you've now gotten through all of the early dialogues, so congratulations. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And also, I would appreciate you hitting the like button. And if you don't know what I mean when I'm talking about early, middle, and late dialogues, there is a video on that. So I invite you to please watch that. And then next week, we're going to get into middle dialogues. We're going to start with a really good one called Theotetus. It's about the question of what is knowledge. We're going to spend two weeks on this one because there's really a lot going on there. I do hope that you will think about subscribing if you're not subscribed already. I do put out a new video once a week and I hope that you will join me next week. Thank you.